to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And the, today on the show, I'm pleased to introduce you to Kay Falstrom. Kay survived a near-death experience that gave her spiritual gifts and abilities of psychic mediumship. She has also done extensive training to perfect her gifts and is a certified medium and a certified spiritual advisor. Kay does phone readings worldwide or in person, readings near her home in the San Francisco area. She teaches classes and workshops on intuition, psychic skills, and mediumship. And she's one of those folks that does group readings on mediumship too. She is also the author of the book, Reborn a Medium, a True Story of Dying, Returning, and Serving Spirit and You. So Kay Falstrom, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you so much for having me on, Sandra. It's a pleasure. Oh, me too. I've got just a gigantic smile on my face. And you're coming <laughs> from California, and I'm on the East Coast, currently in um, Rhode Island at my mom's house right now. Nice. Yeah. So you live in San Francisco area? Yep, I, yep. I go between San Jose and all the way up to Marin, north of San Francisco, and in between. So. Oh, wow. Great. Always nice to, to have a visual as to who I'm talking to and, and where we all are. So, um, just before I press the record button, you and I just talked briefly, and you you mentioned something, that you were a skeptic before as well. And I that gets me curious and if you don't mind just if you would just tell us a little bit about Kay you know maybe where you grew up and how this whole world opened up to you and even being a skeptic because it's obvious you're doing some pretty big things now and so something obviously changed yeah definitely big changes well you know just growing up in the midwest back in the day i mean it was like the late 60s and the 70s there weren't shows about anything that we have shows and books about all over the place so you know, I grew up a skeptic. I didn't believe in anything, you know, ESP, paranormal, we called it at that point. Mm -hmm. Now we call it clairvoyance and clairsentience. But people talked about ESP, and, you know, I just didn't believe in any of it. I just believed in what, you know, was right in front of our eyes and you could prove. So um, it was interesting to go through what I did, uh, but I can relate to you being a skeptic at the beginning. Yeah, you sound just like exactly like my story. We didn't talk about that kind of thing, or if there was a local medium in our town, and my parents just like blew that off. That and she was a psychic. None of her predictions ever came true. And kids, that stuff isn't real. <laughs> okay, uh -huh. all right. So, so then what? So growing up, didn't believe. Grew up in the Midwest. Right? Just, you know, normal kid from the mm -hmm. Midwest and went to school and then got my first job out of school in a little town in Michigan called Kalamazoo. Mm. And I was working at a local TV station there, and that's where it kind of all began. I, I started to think I was getting the flu one evening, so it kind of led into, you know, a really uh, life-changing experience for me with my near-death experience. Uh, what happened? I mean, what take us through what, uh, what happened. You thought you were getting sick and go I mean if you don't mind sharing the particulars of what happened with your near-death experience no that's fine yeah so I just thought I was getting a, like a, a head cold kind of flu kind of symptoms mm -hmm. and kept going back and forth to work and then I was going to go drive around like Michigan to Madison to visit a friend and I called her and I said you know I can't come I'm so sick I just have to stay home and it was just starting to become winter so you you know closing all the windows cranking up the heater for the first time in the winter and um your symptoms just get worse, excruciating headaches. I didn't know what was going on at all. And mind you, I'm, you know, all of like, what, 21 or something. Yeah. And um, there wasn't the Internet. If you can even fathom, there wasn't an Internet to look up your symptoms on. So you right. just go to bed and go to sleep. And I just felt weirder and weirder as the night went on. And I finally drifted off to sleep. But little did I know that going to Madison would have saved my life. So that night in the apartment, something was definitely... Um, getting me and it wasn't uh, the flu it was I felt like I had an intruder in my apartment that evening there was a colorless odorless gas that had been wafting hmm. through my place as I turned on the heater so as your listeners can probably guess I was getting carbon monoxide poisoning and you can't smell it or see it or anything and so you just go to sleep and your body can only tolerate so much carbon monoxide 
mm-hmm. inside of it before your consciousness literally needs to leave your body. And I remember that parts of that journey. And, um, you know, that's what I write about in my book, kind of describing it in minute detail. But um, I remember coming back into my body as well, which makes me, um, you know, I mean, it was just such a unique experience because even when my downstairs neighbor, who was a stranger, came up to save me, and, and that still remains a mystery to me, Sandra, is why did she come upstairs to save me? I mean, we weren't buddies or anything, and she was pretty much the only person outside of work that I even kind of, you know, went past because I was new in town and my first job, and uh, so it was. it's a mystery to me still why she worked so hard to save my life. So it, that's a whole nother part of the story, mm-hmm. if you want me to get into that. Yeah. So it, it, what's interesting is even in, in the emergency room, when she took me to the emergency room, uh, I was still past what a human body can handle with carbon monoxide, but I was conscious, and the doctors were flipping out about that because they tested my blood in the ER, and they thought, well, she's way past what when someone would be dead, so why is she conscious? It completely freaked them out. So. The whole thing about me being able to talk to you today and be here today, I'm so grateful because I shouldn't have lived for under any, you know, medical definitions. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And just thinking of that woman, I you know, the longer I've been talking to people about life after death and getting to grips with we do have guardian angels and guides and things and somebody yelled in her ear, you know, go find Kay and save her life and this is my guess but there you you what we'll get into is what you're doing now obviously and the difference you're making in so many lives so there is certainly a reason you were meant to be continuing on the land of the living yeah yeah it's just um, i'm so grateful in so many ways Mm because you think about all the things you wouldn't have experienced for example i would have never met my nephew you know who was born after i was allowed to come back to live is the way that I think about it is they allowed me to come back because my body was way past, you know, dead, the word that we use. There isn't really death now, I know. But what's also fascinating about coming back into my body is the difference in density and the speed and vibration. And I know that's kind of sounds bizarre, but I I felt like I was pushing back into a substance like melted tar. Because we're in a 3D world, it's really thick and dense and heavy here. Mm -hmm. And when you're out of your body as pure consciousness, it's a much faster, high, fine, subtle vibration. So coming back into our world, all this 3D of weight and density and mass, it's really thick and heavy. And your consciousness has to push back into that, which is an interesting thing to think about. Because once we're back in the body, then you don't feel like it's thick and heavy. Right, so you feel like a, it's normal. Yeah. What What do you remember from your near-death experience? Do you remember anything? I do remember some things. I remember um, it felt like I was talking to guides, and mind you, Sandra, I didn't believe in any of this stuff whatsoever. Right. And my whole family didn't. But I felt like I was talking to a group of very loving beings, mm-hmm. you know, several, not just one. And they were talking about that I was too young and I had to come back and there was still a lot more to do. Uh, But what was so marked is after I came back and how then I was different from how I had been the first 20 years of my life. But that was the main thing. You're too young. Let's send you back. So um, it took me many, many, many years to realize, I think, that I kind of was given a new mission, so Mm -hmm. to speak, over there. And I didn't know what that was when I came back, but it took many years for it to kind of keep, I I call it like knocking at the door over and over and again. And it took me a while to kind of finally figure out what that that was about and to answer it. But, yeah, they were basically saying, hey, let's let's send you back so i'm very grateful because i got to have a lot more years with my mom and meet my nephew and so many wonderful experiences oh that's so great and i know just what you mean about knocking at the door i tried to do everything because i didn't want to be any messenger about life after death i didn't want to talk about grief i wanted to just move on with my life and it just kept knocking it's like yeah. okay i mean there comes a point when there's just way too many synchronicities that you just have to pay attention like okay what am i supposed to do all right all right so what happened for you because um it, it, it did well just tell us after the near death experience time went on you're probably trying to live a normal life again and what kept knocking 
Well, you know, in the beginning, I didn't know what it was because, you know, if it were to happen to someone today, listeners might be saying, well, there's all these TV shows. Of course, it's, you know, this and that and and psychic ability. But I started to have unusual experiences after the near-death experience, but I didn't really get it that I was different. I mean, you're in your early 20s. You're in your first job out of college. You're just trying to get your life started. So one evening, I dreamt the lottery numbers, and I could see the ticket being printed out in in front of my eyes and I memorized the numbers I've always been able to remember numbers and uh, I worked at the TV station where it was my job to call the Michigan State Lottery and get the lottery numbers and then put them up on oh, TV wow. like, like over the screen of Jeopardy you know yep, between yep. the commercials <laughs> that was you okay <laughs> that was me so it was kind of relevant to my world experience because that was my job so you know I'd never played the lottery I'd never seen a ticket we didn't really play the lottery in Wisconsin And so in Michigan, it was a thing. So I dreamt them, and then uh, my mom had flown in that night to visit, and I told the director and my mom, who was at the TV station for a little tour, what the lottery numbers that I dreamt were. And then I called the Michigan State Lottery right at 7.30 when they released them, and those were the numbers, and I just kind of fell into a chair and turned white. (laughs) You just gave me goosebumps, yeah. And then the director, you know, knew what my next task was to put them into something we used to call a Zitophant and stick up on the screen over Jeopardy. And uh, he said, I'll do this for you tonight, Kay, because I just couldn't even move. I was just white. And he said, well, did you buy a ticket? Yeah, of course. (laughs) Did you buy the lottery ticket? And I said, no, I wanted to be on time to pick up my mom at the airport. So it was like I started to have unusual experiences, but that was a relevant way that I feel like um, my guides, the other side, my intuition, whatever you want to call it, Mm -hmm. was saying, you're different, but it still took me many other experiences. So starting to have some knowing about other people. Now, not everybody, but some psychic ability in certain situations. And sometimes it was when there was a big need, like maybe I was in danger or I needed to know something about someone or I was curious about someone. So it started to come, because I didn't really know what was happening, but it started to come when there was some sort of a need. And then uh, I started to realize, you know, gosh, something seems different. And then I met people along the way, and there's a chapter in my book about helpers, because I don't know if you had this, Sandra, but they just kind of showed up, these people that were there to say, you know what, I think you're different after the near-death experience. You know, I've had some unusual experiences, mm-hmm. and I can see that you're starting to have them. And I was like, oh, really? Because I just didn't have any frame of reference for this. Right. And then I moved to California, and lo and behold, that put a lot of people on my path to be able to learn from and study from. So local people in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a spiritualist church. Now there's two spiritualist churches where mediums work and give messages. And then you know, then James Van Prague was coming through town, a world-renowned medium, and teaching a workshop. So I took that as the years went by, and more and more things happened, like premonitions and synchronicities and all those things you're mentioning. So I tried to connect the dots over the years, and then I thought, well, if this is something different about me since the near-death experience, let's see, mm-hmm. you know, if I can get good at it to help people. But the whole thing was about helping people. Right, right. Yeah. hmm yeah. Anytime you're grounded in making a difference for other people, I think that's when you get help, you get pushed along the way. If it was a if it was truly about you winning the lottery, like you wouldn't have gotten those numbers. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It, it wasn't people say, Why did you buy a ticket? And I say, you know, it wasn't about me winning the lottery. It was a it was a relevant way, because that was my job to call the lottery and get mm-hmm. the numbers and it was a relevant way to say, Look, you know something before it happened. And now I know, you know, from what I know and from what I've been through and the different um, things that they've allowed me to see to help me, like seeing me almost have a car accident on Tuesday and then it actually happens on Saturday, so I'm given a warning ahead of time. Sometimes, not every time. Right. But things like that would happen where I realize, you know, we have time and clock so that we know when to be at the dentist on time or when to, you know, file our taxes or whatever. Right. But there isn't really time. It's like it's a construct to organize our world because clearly there's information available before things happen. So on the other side, they know stuff 
that's going to happen in the future. So I don't know. Does that make sense? It does make <laughs> sense. But we still obviously have free will because then you could choose, choose to go another route to avoid that accident, right? Right. We totally have free will, and that's a really good thing. I'm so glad you're bringing that up because, you know, I work with the law of attraction and trying to manifest more of what you want. That's yep. a big part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so... When somebody says, you know, I want a psychic reading, tell me exactly what's going to happen. You know, when am I going to fall in love? It's actually our thoughts and feelings have a lot more to do with it. So, yeah, we do have free will and we can change outcomes. And, yeah, there's a reason to the premonitions and the warnings. So, yeah, I totally believe that we can change things. And it's more about potentialities, not for sure fate, if you will. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does make sense. Let me ask you, um, I know you've studied with James Rohn Prague and also Lisa Williams, right? Yeah, Lisa Williams is, is my mentor. I'm yeah, she's very big, proud to say. Big famous person. <laughs> As is <just> James. <laughs> They're both wonderful. And yeah, I took a workshop with James Van Prague and then many, many classes with Lisa Williams. Mm -hmm. And very, very happy to say that. Um, boy, it was a, a something else, but she, she tested us and, you know, definitely had all kinds of means of testing you and writing results and comparing and rating and all these different things. So that was something else. But, yeah, Lisa's wonderful. She's an excellent teacher. So this is on mediumship. This is wh wh Where would you get to your first training, really, of, like, um, how, I hate to say how to, how to talk to dead people, but, yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? <laughs> It's exactly what we're talking about. And, uh, yeah, that word is something that we use in our culture to say somebody's gone, but they're not really gone, yeah. as you and I know. But my first training came when, uh, I always say it's like a pyramid was building over the years. So after the near-death experience, some premonition, some psychic ability, I started to get messages from the other side, just one from my father who passed when I was nine. Mm. And I had a helper kind of make sense of that for me because I didn't know what it was. And then over the years, um, I did grief counseling and things, and that kind of got added. Then, when I was in graduate school for that counseling, that's when the mediumship, um, you could say, popped out or started to happen. But it's almost like I needed the foundation of all those other layers of mm -hmm. the pyramid before the mediumship came. And so that came after I had enough grounding and information that I was different before they laid on me, mm -hmm. <laughs> getting messages from people who crossed over or passed away, we say. So that started, and then I started to seek out uh, classes to try to make sense of it. And then I started to read the few books that were out there about that at the time. So one of them was, you know, James Van Prague has some wonderful books to kind of orient you to this whole world of hearing messages from the other side. And um, so I was reading those books, and I started to take classes locally with people that I found at the Spiritualist Church. James Van Prague actually told me to go there mm -hmm. when I ran up to him and asked him a question at, you know, the lunchtime break was about to start and I ran up to him and I said, where can I study with someone one-on-one? -on -one? And he said, go to the spiritual church and see if they're offering any classes. So I did and then I started to check out. Mind you, I'm still a skeptic at this point. It's happening wow. to me, but I don't believe in mediumship. Right. <laughs> right. So... I saw someone on TV, um, John Edward, that had a TV show at the yeah, time, yep. and I was watching that show, and I was looking at it, and I thought, how is that possible? That can't be, how is he doing that? That can't be possible. Now, wait a minute. He looks like he's getting some factual information here. So I started to kind of try to be like a little armchair scientist and dissect at the spiritualist church, the mediums, and mm -hmm. were they accurate, and then getting a message myself, and... What's important about getting a mediumship reading is sometimes we can't validate all the information. Some of the times I scribbled down all the information they said, the medium, then I ran home and I said, called mom in Wisconsin and said, mom, this is out there, but I'm going to this spiritual church yeah. where you get messages from people who passed away. We got a message from your brother, Carl, will you um, listen to it and help me tell me what's true and what's not true? And she said, well, sure, why not? Even though she thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. So I told her this story about him in World War II and in a Volkswagen bus driving across countries and, you know, specific things that happened when he went into a country where they were, had border guards and stuff. And that was all in a mediumship message, and I had no knowledge of it. And my mom said, oh, yeah, 
that happened. That actually happened. So my mom could validate what the mediums were saying, and then in some cases I could validate what the mediums were saying from my own knowledge. Right. So I could see that they were doing something and it was accurate. And then, you know, it, you know, it's pretty important to start believing in mediumship if you are one. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> and James Van Prague, when I said at the lunch break, I said, what is going on? I'm seeing people as I'm falling asleep. He said, yes, you are. And I said, what's happening? And he said, well, you're probably a medium. And I thought, okay, let's see how good I can get at this. And then I was studying, studying, studying with local people in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then I would you know, take these workshops with world-renowned mediums and then started on the path just when Lisa Williams was starting to offer more and more and more advanced classes. It was perfect timing. And then you'd had to apply. And then, you know, there might be hundreds of applicants, but she'd select the ones that she felt like should be there. So I just felt so lucky that I, I got into those classes and was able to study with her because that really pushed it to a much different level. Do you remember some of the first medium readings you were doing, even met a bit in the, in the class, that you're, you know, like it's, com- it's really coming through your head <laughs> that you're verifying things that, like are people that are really there or, you know what I'm getting at? Exactly. You know, and I, I sat in what they call, you know, well, a development circle, mm-hmm. which is a group of sometimes psychics, but usually mediums that get together on a regular basis, maybe, say, every Tuesday night or what have you. Yeah, on a regular basis, you get together and practice and, you know, get together and try to get messages. So I sat in a development circle in San Francisco and it was so helpful because it was weekly. So every week I was sitting there in the circle figuring out how you get messages. And then, you know, one that really stood out to me, what just kind of blew me away, is I could feel a very, very, very young presence, like a baby or small child under the age of two. But yet she could communicate from the other side as if she was an adult with full range of thought and feeling. So what she's saying is I was a baby to this person who's sitting across the room from me mm-hmm. and I can do direct messages which means I know who I'm giving the message to. Some mediums that are just excellent um, start to give a message and they say can anyone relate to that and that right. can be called an indirect message. Well I knew it was for this woman sitting across from me and I said gosh you know could I ask you a question did you lose a child earlier in your life because I feel like she's talking to me and wants to say some things to you and she said yes and I just got goosebumps and then I started to give the message about it wasn't your fault you couldn't do any more than that and you know all readings are confidential but sure. you know in this instance we have no idea who I'm talking about so I like I take confidentiality very seriously but oh, yeah. that kind of blew me away that a young 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 soul could speak with like the full range of a soul or emotion and intellect, if you will. So that's when they're three years old. When they come through, they talk like they're older and have more. And, you know, pets can communicate and express thoughts and feelings as well in reading. So That's really, wild. <laughs> I know. And they're funny, too. I had a cat that came through recently that said I had stealth-like moves, like I was all that. It was really pretty hilarious. And the cat gave proof and describe the property they lived on with the creek in the back and specific, like, hummingbird feeders. And, you know, the cat was describing to me clairvoyantly and showing me, here's where I lived. And to the cat, that's important. This is what my house and backyard looked like. And through that, we could, you know, obviously prove that this cat was really talking to the mom. And the cat really wanted to say you were the best mom ever, but there was all that lead in and I had stealthy moves. I thought it was kind of funny that the cat had a little swagger. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I've talked to some um, pet psychics from time to time, even a guy that uh, is a pet medium. And after interviewing him, I just looked at my cat, Harry, right? Now he's, I live with my aunt and the cat loves my aunt and doesn't pay any attention to me. So I actually looked at Harry and I was like, Harry, you can hear me, can't you? You know, like I had this conversation with Harry, just like, I'm sorry, I haven't been giving you love. And, and you talk about stealth moves. Like I, that cat has so has a personality. And after I, I did my apology to him about, you know, not giving him any love because I didn't think he loved me. Next thing you know, he, he came on the couch and sat next to me, which has never happened before. You know, so they yeah. have their personalities. It's just really cool that you can connect with them. They do, and, you know, he got your message. He got what you were saying. Yeah, he he also just knocked down our Christmas tree, so. 
<laughs> that's a whole other conversation. But, you know, you hang know. things with lots of feathers on them. They want to touch them. So now you have your shingle out that you are a medium. And how long have you been um, being a medium, I guess, and doing readings and things? You know, for years and years and years, because I'm a lot older than 21 now, so about 30 years have gone by. So I've done readings for years and years and years as a psychic and a medium. So just uh-huh. real quick, um, most some listeners might know this, but often people don't. A psychic is reading about you and your life, job life relationships, that kind of thing. Right. And sometimes they'll allow you to ask them questions. I do those kind of readings and okay. they can ask questions about their life. And the, the mediumship is bringing through someone who passed away or crossed right. over, I prefer to say. So all the mediums are psychic, but not all the psychics do the mediumship. Gotcha. So I've been doing both for so many years. And um, yeah, just I uh, used to work in corporate America and I was studying this on the side. It was like I... You know, went into a phone booth in the evening and changed into my uh, mediumship outfit and went into the other thing, like, you know, the superhero thing. But you'd go in and practice in the evenings and weekends, and so I've been doing readings for decades. Wow. Wow. So you're convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that we don't die. Well, I know. I mean, you're talking to someone who was on the other side and came Mm. back. So I'm so blessed. But we absolutely don't because, you know, I had consciousness there which is it's me having this experience and then it's me having this experience coming back into the body. So there is no what we call death. It's you're going to uh, another level where you continue to work on your soul and look at your life and personality. There's a lot of good books about that out there. Um, If you want me to mention one or two, I'm happy to. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah, one is The Survival of the Soul by Lisa Williams, which is a great one to start with because she just really maps out what happens when we cross over and what that experience is like. And there's, I'm sure many others kind of that would be, you know, in between. But then there's Testimony of Light by Helen Greaves, which is, I don't know, have you read that? It's completely fascinating because it's so advanced about what happens on the other side. And a nun who passed away wants to write the book through her really good friend, Helen Greaves. And so Helen Greaves channels the book of her friend, talking to her, talking about what it's like over there. And it's absolutely fascinating. Testimony of life. For our listeners, um, Kay Falstrom's episode on WeDon'tDieRadio.com is number 78. So when you go to that website, um, you can see her picture, you can see the link to her own website, and I also have the links to these books that she's recommending. So if you didn't catch it, you don't need to stop and rewind. You can just go to the website and look, okay? <laughs> A little commercial break for we don't die radio.com, but that's where all the episodes are housed as opposed and also on iTunes and many other places. So that's awesome, and I'm certainly going to look up that book and get it. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, where do we go now? How about what's your book about? Well, my book is all the details about that disorienting evening where I think I have the flu and I'm having more and more symptoms Mm -hmm. and go walking through the near-death experience in detail. And there was a lot kind of right after where, you know, you're different after near-death experience, but everybody around you, okay, there's coworkers at the TV station, but then my buddies that I'm starting to meet and make friends in Kalamazoo, they're all in their 20s and they are completely in a different place than you are because, you know, after a near-death experience, you've, you've had an unusual experience and you you are different. Even right. if somebody does, comes back from a near-death experience and does not develop psychic or mediumship ability, you're still profoundly changed in that you know that it can happen at any moment. So I think there's a more seize the day, cherish the moment savor what's happening right now, the sunset or the food or your interaction with someone on the phone, because this is what we have this moment today, and near-death experience, people get it and live it. So I was um, making sense of that. There's another great book on that called Lessons of the Light, talking about how near-death experiences change people, but how even if you don't have one, uh, you don't have to die to, to get the benefits of what you learn after having one, so that's a great book. Um, but You know, uh, you know, I was just kind of uh, walking through in the book that experience and after math, and then I started to talk about the unusual experiences I was having and trying to make sense of them, and that's where the helpers came in. I met, you know, three, four key people in the first few years 
who really were put on my path to show me, hey, you're different, and, you know, do you understand this about your, do you see what's happening? So they could validate what was happening. They encouraged me. They supported me. And that was a big thing about moving to California, because then I could meet uh, more people teaching about this field. Oh, yeah. And I could you know, meet James Van Prague and take his workshop on Knob Hill. And I could, you know, my development circle uh, leader took me to see Lisa Williams live. And at that point, I didn't know who she was. Mm -hmm. And so I was sitting in this audience of like 400 people in this huge hotel in San Francisco. And I think it was um, John Holland gave messages, an excellent medium. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Lisa Williams gave messages. And I was just blown away. And I was watching her work, and I thought, this woman is incredible. And to now think that, you know, I've taken a lot of classes with her, it's just amazing. So I just walked through the book of all of these uh, experiences and the early experiences of mediumship and getting a message from the other side before you know what's happening and before you know what to call it or you're not grounded. And it can be very disorienting. To, to hear from someone who's passed and not really know what's happening. And it's like, okay, someone else is definitely talking to me. Right. And I'm like, okay, if, they, if this is real, give me some proof. And they will give you proof. You know, hey, I was from Czechoslovakia. Check it out with the person who knew me. They'll give you proof. And you can look a lot up on the Internet after you get the message now and then go, wow, that's true. That was really that person. Mm -hmm. So you... I just walked through. Yeah, oh, go sorry. ahead. Uh, um. Sorry to interrupt. I do that from time to time. No problem. No, it's because we're we're all excited talking about all this. <laughs> I know that's what happens. Um, how did they come through to you? Do you see people? Do you feel a presence? Do you hear them? I mean, is it like how do you know? Maybe a dumb one. I mean, I know you no, validate, and that obviously isn't your imagination. But like, how do how do people come through to you? Like, what does it feel like? It feels like. Um, you know, literally, someone's standing there next to you talking to you. So some of my early messages were clairsentient. You just know you know it, but you didn't see it or hear it. But I could also hear it. So I was getting it clairsentiently with feeling the emotion of what they were saying, like, you know, I love this person. Tell them I love them. Or I regret that. Like, they give you the emotion with the message clairsentiently. And then I'm also hearing it auditorily. It's as if someone is saying it you know like but inside your head so you're not hearing it out loud in the room mm -hmm. so i think it's called subjective clear audience and then uh you can actually sometimes hear outside your head with your you know like you're hearing it in the room but this is hearing it inside your head like you'd think to yourself oh i have to pick up milk at the store you'd think it to yourself it's like hearing somebody's thoughts that way so at first when it starts it's very disorienting and you're like i can tell someone's talking to me I know who the message is for. They're telling me who to give this message to. Um, in one case, they said, please give this message to your old high school friend, so-and-so. And I knew exactly who they were talking about. And then he clairvoyantly showed me her doing what she does on stage. And so I could see her. I could see what she does on stage. And me saying, this is who the message is for. Then he said what the message was. And then I challenged him, and I said, what? This isn't real. I said, if this is real, give me some proof, solid proof that I can look up to prove it's you. And he ticked off three or four things. And one was his country of origin and nationality. One was his wife's name. And uh, he talked about what he did in the town I grew up in, and I didn't know who this person was. Mm -hmm. And so he gave me all these points that I could validate, and then, of course, I could, you know, look that up and it was all true plus he wanted me to give the message to this person and I said man she's going to think I'm crazy are you kidding me and he said promise me you're going to give her this message oh my I said, gosh I said okay I will but it was so freaky and so I had to call her and say oh I didn't even have her phone number I had to get it through a mutual friend yeah from high school and I finally got in touch with her I said you know would you like this message and that's a big thing I think for people who have this ability is to ask the person, do you want to hear the message or not? Right. And if they don't want to hear the message, you don't tell them because you respect whether people want to hear it or not. Sure. And then so she said, I don't believe in that, but I'll listen. Yeah. <laughs> so then I had to tell her this message and I said, now I don't know who this person is, but he said, you know, he was this teacher to you. Is there such a person? And she said, yes. And oh I said, my. he's telling me his nationality is this. She said, yes, that's true. Like, she just kept 
I'm talking and oh. then he had a he had a main message for her, which is, and this is in my book, I have permission to talk mm-hmm. about this one, so I'm not breaking confidentiality because confidentiality is super important. I yes. never talk about readings. But I have permission, and the message was, you were the best student I ever had, and he probably taught for 40 years. Oh. So in 40 years of teaching, you know, she was exceptionally gifted, and that's what she does on stage, which is what he showed me at the beginning. So that was important for him on the other side to say, in my whole life, you are the most gifted person of, you know, the subject I was teaching you. That is an amazing story, Kay. In in the beginning, was it that clear, or did you, through your development circles, you could then start really honing in on, oh, this is a person standing here. This is what it feels like. You know what I mean? Right. Did I know take, what you mean. And, and the selfishly speaking, I'm actually asking this question for myself because I've only taken a couple of like weekend medium courses and everything that came through me, as accurate as it was, it just seemed like my imagination. And I'm just wondering, like part of me wants to venture out and either go into a development circle or practice somehow somewhere just to see if more can develop as opposed to these like random hits of being accurate, you know? Yep, you can definitely develop, and that's a huge mm-hmm. thing. I taught two different classes this week, and that's right where the, the more kind of beginner-intermediate students are is, I feel like I'm making this up. I feel like it's just a thought in my head. And so you have to, you know, with a lot of practice and then sharing the information you're getting, even right. if you think you're making up, you've got to say it out loud, and then you get validation of whether it was accurate or not. And, you know, it's not airy-fairy. This is like we're just wanting to go more toward the stuff that's provable, factual, and accurate. Right. Uh, Because I thought if I'm ever going to do this, this has to be helpful to people and it has to be accurate. Now, there's loving healing messages too, but I want some proof in there that it's really the person that, you know, they're expecting. So I work with the students. I teach them you can definitely get better at that. And the early message that I just shared about the teacher coming through, it yeah. was so clear. And you know, what was funny, Sandra, is the first two messages I got, I was in or around water. And um, there's negative ions in water, and you know we get positive ions off of like computers and machines and stuff, but like it's why we feel so good after taking a bath or shower or mm. something. The negative ions in water are healing, but they were also conducive to me receiving a message. So in one message, you know, my hands are in the water, I'm doing dishes, and I get a very clear message. <laughs> yeah. The other message, you know, not that I want to share anything else, but I was in the shower. So right. it's like the water helped me receive the message. So those old funny movies about it was a dark and stormy night at the seance with the rain. Right. There may be something to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because I think the, the water in the early days helped me receive the message. So, um you know, you can look up ions in water, and you can actually measure them. So this is uh, this is a scientific thing I'm talking about. Oh, this is good. So after so. very cool. What's that? No, this is just cool. I I, I don't know so. <laughs> well, after a while, I didn't have to um, be around water or in right. water or have my hands in water. But for a while there, I thought I might have to be a hot tub psychic because <laughs> I might have to be. Oh my in gosh, is that funny? <laughs> That's a, the name of your next book. <laughs> Well, thankfully, I got past that stage, so I can just get the messages without being around water. <laughs> Gosh, I can see that as a Saturday Night Live skit, skit the hot tub psychic. That's really perfect funny. For, perfect for California. It is. So, question, because you actually teach workshops and classes on intuition, psychic stuff, and mediumship. If somebody's just interested, can they? Can you actually learn mediumship, or do you have to be gifted, you know, in, in psychic things? Yeah, Um Let's see. I think everybody has um, an ability to develop their intuition for sure. And I think it's a matter of uh, what, I don't know what the right word is, propensity or natural ability or something Mm -hmm. like. Somebody might be able to get really good at playing the guitar or the piano. Right. And that is not me, you know. Or say my brother can learn all kinds of foreign languages. It's not, it's easy for him. Right. That's not me either. So I after the near-death experience, had like a, more of a propensity to develop the mediumship. And they were kind of showing me over the years, hey, this is continuing to develop. So if somebody has a genetic line of intuition in their family, 
Um, it does run in families. So if you talk about grandma who always knew stuff or mom always knew stuff ahead of time or, you know, this person had my dad was intuitive or whatnot, it does seem to run in families mm-hmm. and that can give you more of a boost, if you will. But I think anyone can develop their intuition and a lot of people are very excited to know intuition can help you choose the right person to date or choose the best job between these two options and it's very practical and helpful um, to develop your intuition so I think anybody can do it and you know it takes a lot of um, time and energy and dedication to get really good at the mediumship and then some people are born mediums Mm -hmm. and you see a lot of internationally known uh, world famous mediums that that's in their book I could see people on the other side of the child then a lot of times, you know, people in their family said, don't do that or stop that, or they shut it down themselves because it was so unusual or uncomfortable. So that's why I chose my book title, Reborn a Medium, because it happened because of the near-death experience. Right. So it's all, it all came after the near-death experience for me. It's, it's so, exciting. I mean, it's, and I, and I want to tell you and our listeners, like, I never thought I had any medium mystic abilities, nor have I gone on to practice it, but it absolutely blew my mind the first person that I said some pretty specific to stuff to. So if you feel like this is interesting, if you feel you want to dabble in this and do a little research and maybe even try it, go for it. I mean, we all have... And Kay, maybe you can address this a little bit. You know, we all have that skeptical nature or this little voice inside of us that say, I can't do it. You're not good enough. It'll, you know, work for that nice girl named Kay and Sandra, but it's never going to work for me. Um, like, we don't have to listen to that voice. <laughs> and it doesn't mean it's the truth, you know, right. if you find yourself passionate about this or even interested. Right. And, you know, the most fun of all is to have somebody that's like, I'm interested in this. I'm going to take your workshop. It's a beginner workshop and, you know, five hours on a Sunday, Mm -hmm. four or five hours. And then they're getting information and they're like, wait a minute, what's happening? That's accurate. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's like we can do so much more than we think we can. So our left brain is the part that jumps in and says, this can't be possible. You can't do that. There's no such thing as telepathy. And then when you actually do it, you start to build the confidence of, oh, this is possible. I just did it. And students, all the time, it's so fun to see their delight when they get specific and accurate pieces of information validated by the person they were just doing a little practice reading with. So it's so fun to teach. It's just so fun to see people just get going with it. And then, you know, you teach them in an intermediate class, and then they get rolling, then they're excited, then they need more practice because you have to discern between what I'm getting that's accurate and then what am I maybe projecting? Because we just project naturally as humans. Oh, sure. just do. Yeah. And then what is not accurate? And then you need to keep doing more of what you got that was accurate if you want to develop. So, And then some people just say, hey, I just want to use it for myself. And, you know, now I can make a lot better decisions, too. But there's a lot of help out there. There's your own helpful intuition. Mm-hmm. There are spirit guides that are real. And um, you know, some of the listeners might be like, oh, she just lost me. <laughs> I, I used to be there. I used to be there like spirit guide, spirit guide. you got to be kidding me. Oh, right. But then they proved that they were real because they were giving me stuff that I didn't tell anybody about that I was asking for in my head. So I thought, What do you mean? Can you give us an example of that? Only because I'm somebody who's interested in finding out who my spirit guides are, not putting you on the spot. But like, what kind of question did you answer that all of a sudden you got something? Well, you know, it was like something I never told anybody else. And boy, they can manifest more quickly than we think. Um, So it was, at the beginning, it was a material object, so it was provable. Um, And then after that, I I experimented more. But I thought on a Saturday, this is a quick, short, long story. I'm Swedish, and I always thought that black Saab cars were so cool, right, back in the day when I was a little kid, because they had heated seats, and in Wisconsin, a heated seat in the winter would have been really nice. Oh, yeah. I always thought black Saabs were cool, and so I saw one drive by my San Francisco apartment, and by now I'm, you know, starting to get my messages and stuff and whatnot, so it was the next thing I needed to learn was this lesson about spirit guides, but I looked down at a black Saab driving past, and I thought, just like, just thought in my own head, oh, yeah, I wonder if I'll ever get that car. Probably not. And then three days later, somebody sent me an email and said, hey, I know you have a perfectly good new car, but I'm only sending this to you. I don't know why, but here, they're selling this car. It was the salesperson's car at this company. And I thought, oh, just for fun, I'll look at the picture. It was a black Saab. That was three days later. 
So I, by selling my car, had just enough money to get the used car at the company. And so then I, <laughs> three days, in three days, and I thought something is listening to my thoughts because that's so uncanny. It was uncanny for my friend was like, I don't know why I'm sending you this. I know you have a new car and I'm not sending this to anybody else. It was just bizarre. So I thought something's listening to what I'm thinking. What is going on? Again, I'm a skeptic. Right. <laughs> So then I started to test it with what was more important to me, relationships. And so, sure enough, if you ask for help, it really helps with manifesting relationships. Like, hey, you guys send me somebody. Help me. Help send me the right person. That would be better for me next time. And it sounds crazy, but they're actually helping you. And so I do readings on this. So some readings are bringing through people's spirit loved ones who passed, mediumship reading. Some people say, no, I want help with my life. And I can actually hear their spirit guides tell them specific and practical, helpful information. Like, you know, I have permission to talk about this one, too, because it just happened and she was blown away. She didn't know what her next job was going to be. A client was very lost. I don't know what to do next. I lost my job. And the spirit guides were describing a catering spread, beautiful food and wine and cheese and everything. And... She said, I don't know what that means. I said, well, they're showing me intricate detail of catering. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of days later, she was running around applying for things, and she got the catering. Somebody said, oh, I'm a caterer, and I need a personal assistant. And she got that job, and she called me and said, oh, my gosh, my spirit guides are telling me, like, take the catering job. So Do we have very What? No, if you finish your sentence, and I'll jump in and ask. No, I'm, I'm good. We're so funny. I'm a, I can't wait to meet you in person. We have to set this up. Um, asking for help, is that something we have to ask for, or do they just, like, give it to us when you sit ask really, for help? Because I don't ask for too much help, even though I need it. But maybe the thing to do is to start asking. Right. That is a key step, and I kind of map all the steps out so people can have, like, a one, two, three, how to work with spirit guides um, in my book. But asking is super important. So some people say to me, but why? If they're there for us, I mean, I don't even believe in them, but if they're there for us, why wouldn't they just help us and know what I want? There's actually something helpful about figuring out what you want first, then asking. I would love it if you would help me with this. It's very important. And then your intention is super important. So if your intention is like, whatever, if I ever get that, it's fine. Right. Job, like, relationship, house job, whatever. But if, you're re if your intention is super strong, like, I deserve a healthy relationship, I really want it next, you know, like this next relationship, boom, your intention is so strong, then you ask for help, you will, and then you have to take some steps toward it. It's the law of attraction. So if you're working with your own helpful intuition, the law of attraction, and you learn how to work with your spirit guides, oh my gosh, step aside, you're going to manifest. This is all great. in your book by the way yeah it's so it's <laughs> life can be easier life can be easier everybody <laughs> i'm not trying to sell a book even though i always very often read the books from my um people i interview but like like personally i mean this is good stuff so in the name of your book is reborn a medium a true story of dying returning and serving spirit and you from k falstrom and let me just give your your website too because you have a last name like mine. It sounds like one thing, but it's spelled somewhat a different way. Kay's website is um, kayfallstrom.com, which is K-A-Y-F-A-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. Or again, if you go to wedontdieradio.com and look under episode 78, I have a link right to her website and her book and everything there. So just looking at the time, time always goes by very quickly when I am engaged and we're, I'm talking to a fun person. Um, what else should we talk about? Like, what do you think maybe life is for? And I always like to leave us all with something inspiring that we can use in our day and um because Kay, you know life can be really awful sometimes really hard there can be suffering yeah. uh we're doing this recording right now and it's just prior to um christmas and new years and and it's a tough time of year but anything you feel like you want to share about anything empowering yeah, I mean, I just want to say life can be hard and it can be difficult and, 
you know, there can be lots of grieving, and I've been through big losses this year myself, but there's help, and there's so many things out there, tools to use to help yourself. So like I said, if you get to know your intuition to help you make decisions, if you work, start to work with your spirit guides, you don't even have to believe in them. They're mm-hmm. there anyway, and they'll work with you anyway, and you can get proof that they're really there through a short reading even. But then you start to work with the law of attraction. You can make your life better. And, you know, yes, we lose people and have to grieve, but because the people on the other side can still have a sense of humor, and it can be very uplifting to get a mediumship reading, to hear from your person and spirit that you miss. Right. And there's also, no matter what you're suffering with, no matter what you don't like about your life, there's effective hypnotherapy. The power of your subconscious is, it can do anything. It can help you get more of what you want in any way. There's EFT, emotional freedom technique, and tapping, some people call it. There's if you've had trauma or you have negative core irrational beliefs like I'm unlovable or I'm not mm-hmm. worthy. There's EMDR. There's, there's so many tools. Go to something to help yourself feel better. You can, you can feel better for sure, and you can manifest more easily. So there's, it's an exciting time um, to be listening and alive because there's so many ways that we can help ourselves. Oh, that's really beautiful. And just, you are open, obviously, for medium readings, but um, could you just go through a little bit more about what you offer yourself? Like, sure. say, I want to get back in touch with you and have a session. <laughs> sure. Yeah, what do you so do? Someone could, some people can call me and say, hey, I'm really at a crossroads. I just want to know about my life. I don't mm-hmm. really need to hear from people who cross. I'd call that a psychic reading, and then they can ask, you know, two or three specific questions about their life. Their spirit guides will answer for them, and those are provable readings. You're getting detailed information that's concrete, or you can say, I want a mediumship reading to hear from somebody that I love that passed away, friend or a relative, or some people say, hey, I want half of each. Can you do that? And I say, sure. So, you know, I can divide it up however they want, 75% about me, 25% from a person who passed. So a good medium doesn't want to know who's in spirit, so I don't want to know who's in spirit ahead of time. I also do effective hypnotherapy, Mm -hmm. and that can be done by Skype to help with getting over fear of public speaking, losing weight, getting more productive, quitting smoking, you name it. Um, and then there's there's all kinds of other things I offer, like EMDR helps with those beliefs like I'm unworthy or I'm unlovable, or there's trauma in your past, and you can get past it. Hypnotherapy can be a few sessions and very effective, and people make tons of progress even after the sessions are done. Same with EMDR, you can clear the trauma or the negative core irrational beliefs in just a few sessions. So it's you're worth it to get past this. And then learning how to manifest and working with the law of attraction just makes your life more fun and easy. So I offer all of that. That's awesome. Is it easy to get in touch with you? Meaning, um, I know there's some mediums that I would love to talk to, but it's an eight-month waiting list. Um, yeah. are, is it a long time before somebody could actually get to speak with you? No, it's not a long time. I mean, I'll I know be honest. Very no. Yeah. Not a long time. I mean, sometimes you book a few weeks out, but sometimes you can still get in this week or next week. Mm. And so, you know, it just depends on how how far, you know, different parts of the year are busier. So it just kind of goes up and down. But just give me a call. I'm fastest by phone, but you can always email me through my website, kfalstrom.com, either the contact page or the book a session page. And um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But, yeah, there's help out there. And, uh we're just happy to help with whatever people are wanting to get beyond. Mm. Is your phone number something you want to share, or you would other people go to your website? No, I'm fine with that. It's 415-420-4994, and it's um, right there on my website okay. on all the pages. Okay, and I'll include that, too, on We Don't Die Radio, episode 78. Well, Kay, thank you so much. Do you have any closing words? You may not, but you may. I just want to thank you, Sandra. This was a pleasure, and I'm so excited to talk to your listeners. And there's help. Help yourself out there. You can have a better life. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And and also for our listener, you know, I think you know me by now. Hey, wait a minute. This might be your first episode that you're listening. But if you should listen to several of the episodes, I, I'm really out to not only hear some great evidence of life after death, but also to have you live a, a better life now. Because I really do believe that 
when we treat our life that it's an education for our soul, when we really believe that we don't die, um, it takes away, when we take away the fear of dying, it kind of takes away the fear of living. And personally, I feel like our life is meant to be lived, to have all these emotions, to have these experiences for our soul to grow. So with each and every episode, I want to give you some tools to live a better life and to know that your loved ones are still around and that you, you are important. And if you should um, book a session with one of the guests, fine. If not, fine. It's, it's not about that. It, and I think you just from listening to Kay Falstrom, you know that she is a good, loving, generous person. And, and hopefully this episode has made a difference for you in your life. So all to say, I want to close this episode um, once again by saying go to wedontdieradio.com and see some of our past episodes and see this information about Kay Falstrom. And uh, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I want to thank you for listening. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.